टुडे uh thank you everyone thank you all for giving this opportunity to talk about uh, this wonderful topic i'm dr karthik kumar from arvind hospital and uh, today we are going to talk on positive biomarkers in dme so as you all know diabetic retinopathy is uh, microvascular disease which is progressive and uh, sorry, WHO... doctor, can you put it in presentation mode okay sorry is it okay now perfect sir so diabetes is a progressive microvascular disease and who estimates that almost 36 million people will be diabetic by 2030 and almost half of them will be having diabetic retinopathy 30% of the diabetics over 20 years will be having some form of dme so as we all know uh, dme requires repetitive in, uh, invasive intravitreal injections and this is going to place a heavy burden on the patient and overall healthcare and uh, by now actually there are no reliable methods to uh, determine which individual with dme is going to get good vision over a period of time and uh, so there are some unmet needs which uh, can be answered by these biomarkers uh, which are basically a merged word of biological marker this refers to some uh, the medical signs that can be objectively taken into account which indicates the state of health and well being of an individual they can be anatomical biochemical or it can be a molecular parameter and here in dme it can be imaging facility also so there are various imaging biomarkers like fundus photography uh, autofluorescence uh, fluorescence angiography oct oct angio adaptive optics and today we'll discuss uh, the biomarkers on oct and last uh, one slide on oct angiography now why oct oct is uh, i mean it is non contact non invasive you don't have to pick the patient it gives very high resolution images similar to an optical biopsy and uh, of course because of all these things you can consider this as a very good biomarker to predict the visual outcome so these are two biomarkers which uh, i am going to discuss and the first and foremost thing everyone talks about the macular thickness i mean whenever a patient comes if the patient has dme the first thing which comes to our mind is retinal thickness and of course the foveal contour is going to be lost so when we see the oct what we are going to see is basically the macular thickness map this is the etdr is circle with uh, three circles the one in the center is uh, the 1 mm circle the one next is the 3 mm radius circle and the last one is the 6 mm circle the one in the center is basically the one 1 mm circle which we are interested in and the average thickness here is called as the central subfill thickness which we are interested in. and uh, as all the studies says significant increase in this macular thickness is associated with increase in the severity of uh, diabetic retinopathy and of course there are going to be decrease, decrease in the visual acuity and of course with uh, good treatment with either anti vegf or steroid if the macular edema decreases we always assume that the visual acuity is going to get better and there are different types of diabetic macular edema we have spongy form we have cystoid form we have serous detachment and of course we had a traction we have also have a traction rd a study of 125 eyes with uh, treatment naive dme report overall was visual acuity with uh, the cystoid form more than the other forms serous detachment is seen in around 30% of the dme more common with severe forms of diabetic retinopathy and uh, one study says that the presence of serous detachment at baseline is also with a very favorable uh, visual outcome post treatment and um, interleukin 6 levels were significantly higher in eyes with serous macular detachment than in eyes with other form of diabetic macular edema which indicates there is an active ongoing inflammation and many of them prefer to use steroids in these conditions and many many literature review uh, states that um, uh, diffuse macular edema gives better visual acuity than other other forms of macular edema but overall there is no consistent data to support that one form of macular edema is going to be having a poor prognostic significance than others and talking about cystoid macular edema visual acuity is not associated with uh, either the presence or absence of cyst but we have to take into account the number location and the size of the cyst rather than just the presence or absence of cyst the larger cysts are definitely going to have the negative effect on the retinal sensitivity it is basically the amount of remaining retinal or the foveal tissue 
which is going to tell us about the visual acuity. There are many studies again which tells that the size and location is not going to be. Uh, I mean, it is going to be of uh, significance, but mainly the remaining tissue which is left behind is what is going to determine the visual acuity. So now taking consideration into all these things, whether the macular thickness or the central subcutaneous thickness alone is enough to predict the visual acuity in DME. So that is the question which we all have to think. So protocol A uh, in a DRCR net where they compared the OCT measured retinal thickness and visual acuity in eyes with macular edema before and after macular laser photocorrelation. It tells us that there is only a modest correlation between BCVA and the central point thickness prior to focal laser. And of course, there is a, only a modest correlation between the uh, change in visual acuity and change in the uh, central point thickness through the first year following laser. So many eyes with thickened maculars had good visual abilities and many eyes with normal thickness had decreased visual ability. This is uh, termed as paradoxical visual ability, which is very difficult to explain. So these suggest that OCT measurement alone may not be a good surrogate marker for visual ability as uh, these studies state. And there's another study, which is the protocol T, is a post hoc analysis of uh, the data uh, it says that there is at best a moderate correlation between visual acuity and uh, change in the macular thickness after VGF therapy, but this accounts only for a small proportion of cases actually. So for any given change in the OCT, CST from baseline, there is a broad range of changes in the visual acuity at baseline at 12, 52, 1, 1 out per week. So uh, from all these things, we understand that CST is a useful anatomic surrogate to diagnose and monitor DME but of course it is not an accurate predictor of BCVA. So we have to search for other uh, biological markers also so that we can explain the patient about the prognosis. All the, uh, I mean, all the things the patient worries is only about the visual acuity. We are, even though we explain that the macular thickness is small and all those things, the one thing the patient expects is vision. And so to tell the prognosis to the patient, we have to probe further actually. So one such thing is the drill that is disorganization of the retinal inner layer. So this is nothing but, um, how do you say, this is basically the loss of boundaries between the layers of retina. It is defined as horizontal extent in microns for which uh, basically the boundaries between the ganglion cell, inner plexiform, inner nuclear and outer plexiform could not be identified. So uh, to tell you, see, this is the area where we can have, or we can see the layers of retina which are quite intact. But this area, we see that there are no layers as such. So to identify drill, it is very easy actually. So what we have to do is from outside the central macula, we have to trace these layers and come to the fovea. If you are able to come and reach the central fovea, it means there is no drill. If the segmentation zones are not present, then drill is present. So it is as simple as that. So this drill, um, uh, I mean, about this drill, actually, there's a paper by Dr. Jennifer Sun. This is the first paper which talks about drill as a predictor of visual acuity in eyes with central involved diabetic macular edema. These are the pictures from the paper. So what they concluded was centrally located drill is correlated to visual acuity in eyes with central uh, involved DME. So change in drill seems to be a robust predictive biomarker for future visual acuity outcomes. And um, of course, Association of drill extent change with visual acuity is more consistent than any other OCT parameters evaluated for central subcutaneous thickness change. So they concluded that if there is more than 50% of drill affecting the central 1mm zone of the retina, that is the central subcutaneous thickness zone, then the patient is going to have poor visual outcome. And more than 300 micron change from the baseline in the central 1mm fovea, from baseline that is uh, from four months and to uh, about eight months period. So any change in the drill area is also going to be very um, associated with very poor visual problem. So drill, uh, what is basically drill is basically the uh, destruction of the cells in the inner retina, basically the bipolar cells, amacrine cells and horizontal cells. And the hypothesis is that there's going to be a disruption of pathways that transmit information from photoreceptors to the ganglion cells. So the key thing is, uh, you, you I mean, we usually see drill in chronic patients that is more than six months of macular edema. And these patients are going to have significant amount of metamorphopsia 
and uh, of course when the slight improvement in brill the visual acuity also improves so these are the things which we get from this paper and uh, next another important thing is the hyper reflective focus so these were described by bose et al and uh, these are dots which we see commonly in the ocd in all the layers of retina particularly the inner layers so these are thought to be subclinical hard exteriors these are thought to be due to the breakdown of inner blood retinal barrier which leads to lipid extravasations thus these are nothing but subclinical hard exteriors these are seen in dm many times we do see in other conditions also like um, uh, wet amd so there it is thought to be something like migrating rp so the degenerative photoreceptors and of course uh, many people do consider this as activated microglia and uh, the presence of many hyper effective foci indicates that we are dealing with tissue disintegrity more uh, more in case of severe dmes and uh, they do respond to anti vgf injections if they have if the patient has high number of uh, hyper effective foci we can tell the patient that the treatment is going to be slightly poorer and but as the outcome is going to be slightly poor with the anti vgf and uh, we can consider steroids because uh, many pe many people consider these to be some form of inflammation so steroids do work better with patients with hyper reflective foci and one interesting finding is that hyper reflective foci uh, positively correlates with the hpa1 value so if the patient is going to have high level of hpa1c we do expect some higher amounts of hyper reflective foci in the ocd pictures and of course if the elm is going to be disrupted these hyperfocal foci do go into the outer retina and if you find these in the choroid it means that uh, the patient is definitely going to have some poor visual acuity and uh, higher form of diabetic retinopathy like more in pdr than in pdr so these are things about the hyperfocal foci and uh, another important thing is the elm which you all see this is the elm which is shown here this is a line which is uh, most important we all see the elm in the ocd there is a plexus between the molar cell and the photoreceptors it is basically the third blood retinal barrier when this is disrupted the fluid enters the outer retina and uh, this uh, elm status is more closely related to the visual acuity and dme and it is useful for prognostication purpose also so here you can see in the picture that the elm is gone and uh, the patient is going to have definitely some poor vision and um, we all talk about the isos junction which is basically the photoreceptor layer there are various terminology like cost uh, line ellipsoid zone so we just uh, make the uh, make the matter, matter simple we will address it as isos junction so these are basically the photoreceptor layer any disruption of these photoreceptor layer is going to be more damaging so this is the yellow line actually which represents the isos junction and uh, the percentage disruption of this layer has significant predictor of visual acuity in patient with dme so we have to assess this isos junction and um, of course this is going to be a you can also actually grade both this elm and the ellipsoid zone or the isos junction are closely related actually so one gets disrupted the other also has chance of getting disruption usually the elm goes before the ellipsoid zone and uh, finally about the choroid in dme we find that the choroid is thin actually so this mean choroid thickness is much thinner in patient with dme and um, of course if you have a thick choroid it is going to be uh, the choroid is going to have intact uh, choroid capillaries so lesser outer retinal ischemia and of course the photoreceptors are going to be preserved so better visual acuity so that is the concept behind this thin and thick choroid so basically we can see the choroid for uh, the thickness in case of dmes and finally a note on uh, uh, a topic called parallelism so what they do is basically the uh, the outer retina the subfoveal area covering the photoreceptors are skeletonized actually and the segmentation lines are taken into account and we see the lines whether they are parallel to each other so when they are parallel to each other the vision is going to be better in dme this parallelism is significantly lost so this is one of the parameters which we can take into account and a note on ocd angiography we are very excited about ocd angiography because we don't have to uh, inject the patient with fluids in there without uh, doing anything without uh, going for a time consuming invasive procedure all we can do is take a ocd angiography and see for the uh, fz the uh, foveal avascular zone in diabetic macular edema is usually irregular and is going to be large especially the deep capillary plexus gives a, 
uh, good idea about the extent of diabetic macular edema and if the deep capsule flexus is going to be good, we can say that the treatment to intravital injection will also be but as I, I mean, it's going to be good actually. And many microorganisms which are not seen on FA can also be picked up by OCT angio. And if you're going to talk about the vessel density, um, of course, in case of diabetic macular edema, the parafoveal area is going to have poor vessel density right from the initial uh, to begin with, basically. So, for, I mean, uh, in the end, take home message. OCD serves a very good biological marker because it is non-invasive. Nowadays, it is available everywhere, actually. And uh, central cervical thickness, yes, it was, it is, and it is regularly believed that it is going to be correlating very well with the visual acuity, but many times it's not going to be so. Other factors like drill, hyperfective foci, ELM continuity, integrity of the IOSS junctions are also going to be very important to predict the visual acuity. Of course, you can also take into account the choroid and uh, OCTA to see the foveal vascular zone. And uh, thus, these OCT biomarkers can help in diagnose, uh, create the severity of the disease, modify our treatment regimen, and predict the prognosis in diabetic macular edema. So, in the end, don't consider only, this, uh, only about the macular thickness, which should also go deep inside the OCT, check for other OCT biomarkers to help the patient, um, uh, to help the patient and also to prognosticate the disease actually. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you.